Thank you all very much. Uh, I hope you can actually move in a little bit. I think we're, that's enough social distancing. I, I, I'm pretty sure I can't hit you from here with anything. But, uh, so a couple of really quick introductions. So, whoa. <laughs> this audio? Okay, all right. So first and foremost, I want to introduce to you my son, who's sitting over there in the uh, multicolored shirt, his first half time. So, round of applause. And then trying to hide here behind this monitor is a good friend of mine and actually one of my clients, Mark Majid from Digital Assets Redemption. And he's actually one of the companies that we work with in making payments to ransomware threat actors. So, um, my name is Guillermo Christensen. And I operate really on the darkest side of all this. I'm a lawyer. Before that, I spent about uh, almost 20 years in the government. I was at the CIA and at the State Department. So pick and choose which of those is the worst option for you. The, the lowest you can think of me, one of those has got to be one of them. Anyway, what I do right now is I run a data security practice at a law firm. And that means I do everything from going to companies to help them figure out how to avoid getting owned by threat actors, all the way to dealing with incident response. And that's where the ransomware stuff has really been just going like crazy for the last two or three years. I was actually involved in dealing with a ransomware incident going back to like 10 years, and I've had the unique uh, pleasure of dealing with the North Korean ransomware incident where we could not make the payment because any payment to a sanctioned country is illegal. So that's some of the background. So, how many of you attended the ransomware panel? They had a track to attend. So that, I think they had some good background. What I'm going to talk to you about is what this looks like in real life from the perspective of the victim, the people who are involved in dealing with the ransomware, and the pain. Okay? And this got really, really complicated in the last year when the Department of Treasury put in place an advisory that said, if you don't know basically who you're paying, you've got to be really careful because there's certain people who you're not allowed to pay. And you've got a small group of Russian hackers, you've got everybody in Iran, everybody in Syria, everybody in North Korea, and even some groups on Korea and Cuba now that you've got to be really careful. And the problem is, if you try to make a payment to them, the people involved in this ecosystem of the ransomware, that includes me, that includes Mark, includes the insurance companies, is going to say no. No way. Because it's basically a strict liability crime. That means if you do it, even if you don't know that you're doing it, the government will come after you more likely. At some point, is what we expect. So, typically what happens is, I get a call from your typical, either your general counsel, so the chief lawyer at a company, or sometimes it's the CISO, and they have discovered a ransomware, right? And ransomware is one of those easy cybersecurity problems to deal with because it's obvious you have a problem. It's not a, do we have somebody on the network, are they doing something? Very rarely do I have the luxury of a client that has seen the activity and is responding before they have exploded the weapon on the network. I wish it happened a whole lot more. And if they listen to me with my risk assessment, they might do that. But we'll leave that aside for now. So they've had ransomware detonated on their, on their network. They're seeing stuff going on. Sometimes I don't get a call for four or five days, right? Because their IT team is desperately trying to fix it. And they don't exactly know what's going on, but they don't want to tell me. Right? And that's a horrible thing. And I really feel sorry for them both. This is, this is just a shit show for everybody concerned. But in the middle of that, right, they finally have to call somebody, and eventually he gets to the general counsel. The general counsel then says, you know, I'm a property lawyer, I'm a real estate lawyer, I'm a you know, general corporate lawyer, what the hell do I know about this? Right? And then hopefully they find their way to me. And so when we come in, we bring in a team of people. So I have a couple of people on my team who actually can do keyboard on, you know, fingers on keyboard, but mostly we will pull in incident response, so DFIR, IR resources. The first thing I ask my client is, do you have cybersecurity insurance? 
That is the single most important inflection point of us. Because if they do, they're probably going to be okay on some of the worst damage. Most cyber insurance does cover ransom. They have extortion policies. It's not easy, it's kind of a complicated thing, but most of them have. If they have that, then they get payment, or if they will get reimbursed for my work, they get reimbursed for the recovery and mitigation work, and most critically, they'll probably get the money to pay the ransom. Right? So a lot of these ransomware events, it's not the company that's paying the ransom. Effectively, it's an insurer. And there are two models. One is reimbursement, so the company fronts the money, and they get it back. Others, the insurance company actually makes the payment to people they work with on a regular basis. And one of those companies is arms company, Digital Assets Redemption. So, the real problem here is all you know is when you have to raise a lot of cryptocurrency quickly, it changes. And we're talking about, I've negotiated ransoms down from 10 million to five. There are people out there who pay 20 million, 30 million dollars. Almost all of them big right now? 94%. I'd say we probably know about 30 to 40 percent of all the payments. 20 percent. So 20 percent of all the payments we have visibility into in this world. So it's not like the old days where I could go and buy some Bitcoin on the side, fund the wallet, get it to these guys. No. Now this is at scale. So there are very few people who are involved regularly in making the ransom. But before we get to the ransom, there's an entire negotiation process that is a bit surreal. To call it a negotiation, I think, is actually inaccurate. Because there's very little influence that we have on the threat. The best we can do is to educate them as to why their view of what we have is not as good as what they were. So, and unfortunately, a lot of them are really good, as you can imagine, you know a lot about the big right? So, the first thing they will do, they go in and they check to see their insurance policies. In fact, sometimes they have to a copy of the insurance policy before the client is going to have to find it. So right off the bat, they probably know that the client has about five million or ten million in coverage. What's the ransom going to be in that situation? Now, the way these insurance policies work, and this is not all of them, they all are different, but you basically have a bucket of money as the as the victim that you can pull money out of. And you use that money for everything. You use it for the lawyers, the remediation, the ransom. So the less money you spend on ransom, the more money you have to fix on this. So there is an incentive here for the victim to try to reduce the amount. Interestingly, that incentive doesn't exist as well on the insurance company's side. The insurance company's incentive is to pay as little, or whatever help it is, takes care of the problem on their own. Which sets up some interesting dynamics. And I think you can imagine what those are. So, once we've got some idea of who's behind this particular incident, and usually we find a text file, if those of you who do the forensics, you know, you find a text file, you find some artifact on some system that tells you, get in touch with us, usually it's proton mail, there are a variety of different ways, and we initiate contact. Right? And then it's this really weird negotiation process where we kind of pretend that we've never done this before, Sometimes we don't, but most of the time there's this sort of effort to pretend that this has never happened before, and and the threat actor is telling us what to do. And we go round and round, and the part of this that's hard to sometimes estimate is do we want to move to pay quickly so we can get the decryptor and kick the recovery off as soon as possible? Or if my IR team and my forensic team is telling me, I think we've got a shot at recovery without the encryption. Then you've got to start thinking about whether you want to slow roll this whole process. 
so you can get to a point where you find out, look, we can do it without pain. Because I will tell you this, I absolutely hate pain rights. I know no one wants to pay. The victim companies are usually extremely upset about that. So if we can figure out a way out of this without having to pay, everybody's out. Another thing we have to do is figure out what the hell are we going to lose if we don't pay the rent. Right? Now, sometimes it's easy. The system is completely messed up. There's no, nothing's up and running. So you can pretty much tell, well, if you need whatever that is, it's not working. Other times, you can recover enough two or three days ago and then you've got that delta, right? And with most of these ransomware encryption tools, they hammer big databases particularly hard. Well. As you can imagine, they start encrypting while the data is moving, and so they start killing the process in weird ways. So even if we get the decrypt and it works, they're really hard to recover, practically impossible. So in those situations, I can tell the client, we're not getting those three days back. So what's the value of that? One of the things that still amazes me, how few people know what the value of their data is in companies, right? You think about today, everybody knows companies are data companies, but monetizing it, converting it into a value. So a lot of times I've got to pull in business people and say, okay, this is worth 50,000 bucks, 100,000. And most of the time they'll tell me it's a lot less than the ransom. That helps me because it sets the floor, it sets some metrics that I can use to figure out what it's worth it to us to recover. And the question then is, are we even close to what the ransomware demand is? And sometimes the data is worth 100 grand, and we're getting a, a, a ransom demand for 5 million. There's no way we're going to reach that. And the reason is, the threat actors are repeat players. And the people negotiating are repeat actors. So one of the things that doesn't always come up when you're talking about ransomware is that it's actually a very small group of people constantly negotiating against each other. So if a pull one out of the big dark side negotiates a 50% reduction one day, the next day, that's where I'm going to start. So they don't have an incentive as some people think, to walk away with whatever they can get. They have an incentive to keep the market at a certain level. And so we routinely see these things falling apart because they will not come below a certain number, and we're not going to come above. And that's it. And, and it's interesting because you think about it, isn't one billion or two billion better than zero? If they're not going to comply? Not in their case. Right? So that's another piece. And this is where, I was talking to the gentleman in the green shirt there about attribution. This is where the attribution problem is very important. Knowing as much as you can about who you're negotiating with is incredibly helpful. This became a real pain in the neck with RAPS, right? Ransomware as a service and platforms where you got a lot of people jumping on using the same type of attack, but they're all different people on the other side. They have different incentives to negotiate according to whatever it costs them to break into that system. And they probably pay to some, for some amount of money, right, to get access to that system. They went to, a, to an access broker, they did something, so they have some money on So, this is kind of, this is the ecosystem we're playing in all the time. Uh, and then, at some point, we get an agreement, and, you know, usually we try to do what we call proof of life, before that, which is nothing more, you know, in the old days when we were negotiating grants for a human being, proof of life was, you know, what you see in the movies, they get you on a screen or, you know, in the worst case, it's you a piece of a finger or something, right? Well, that's not technically a proof of life, it's a proof of life. Anyway, um, in this situation, the proof of life is, I take a couple of files that have been encrypted, I send it to them, and they send it back to me in quick text. Right? So, after that, we start spinning up the machine that Mark and his team have, which is basically how much are we going to need and when is it going to be ready. And 
We can make these payments now in just a couple hours, right? So we can move quick. And I say we, it's, it's, that's what they do, and there's some other ways we can do that. Um, and then, and then we get, you know, we get the payment across. And uh, I, I got to say, I don't actually ever type in those numbers, but I know the people who do are probably nervous as hell because you put one digit wrong in the digital wallet, and somebody just scored five million dollars. We should never hit that. So off it goes. Hopefully, we can turn. These days, I'd say well north of ten percent. By the time we get the deeper, maybe ninety-five percent. Very different. And I'd say most of the time it works well on most things. So no, no limitations, right? Uh, and then after that comes the really hard part. You know, three to four months of rebuilding systems and, and all that stuff. Now a couple of things to tell you about this that you know, I think it's important as, a, as an add-on to the panel today. We work very closely with everybody in the world. We just feel it's, it's kind of our duty. You know, this, this problem is not going to go away without tracking these people down to the extent we can. So we share a lot of information. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, you know, the Colonial Pipeline attack afterwards, the Bureau, from what they've said, was able to recover around half of the money. So, and, and I've got some insights into that if you want to talk about. But that's basically what grants as seen from the eyes of an incident responder slash lawyer. You know, it's got to deal with the whole thing from the beginning to the end. Now, there's also the data exfiltration piece. We can talk about that as well. I generally tell my clients, if they tell me that they've taken data, we are not paying for it. I mean, if you really want to pay for it, okay. But what I mean by that is, don't pay for something that you can't get any assurance is actually going to happen. By that I mean, that they're going to delete the data or not put it on a list, right? Most of the time, if you know it's going to end up somewhere, they may not put it on their on their particular public website or their their, their you know, uh, marketplace. But they'll do something else. So if it's important, you worry about it. Twenty minutes. I think it gives me about fifteen questions. Why 
We'll let this guy answer. Probably has one one hundredth of the liquidity of Bitcoin, and so their ability to get into an exchange and offload it is uh, cumbersome. It also takes a lot longer to deliver. So when there are time pressures on their server, they just want to get it done. Sometimes it's just accepted, right? And they're they're like the twenty twenty five percent compensates them, which is why that's where they're like, we'll take four million in Monero, five million in Bitcoin, and like. We'll use that million dollars to pay for that. So, but I'll make a prediction here. Right now, the cyber insurance market that fuels, and I'm not blaming the, the, the insurance companies, but, but the fact that they were paying the insurance, that they're paying the ransom through insurance, means there's more money to pay ransoms or ergo. That is changing because the insurance companies this year have lost their shirts over ransom. They were at 150 percent loss ratio, so they were losing a lot of money after a lot of years of about 50 percent, where they were making a lot. So I expect two things: one, they're going to write a loss of paper, and two, it's going to be a lot more expensive, and it's going to have less coverage. That I think is going to make ransoms come down. As they come down, but there are more of them, it's going to be easier for them to happen. And that's going to be an interesting change in the environment because right now, with all the chain analysis tools, everything that everyone is trying to come up with for Bitcoin, it's not that hard to follow the money. I argue, and I told the, the, the law enforcement guys this, that digital money is a lot easier for law enforcement to deal with in that context than paper. Now, obviously, crypto, I mean, the electronic crime, like ransomware, could not be done quite on scale if you have to go and haul a bag full of money, right? That's how the bad guys always get caught with traditional person, you know, when they're ransoming someone. Um, but I think the uh, the threat actors, and I prefer to call them that than hackers, because we're all hackers here. We, we don't do this shit, these guys or something else. So the threat actors are, are learning very quickly how to make sure that something like what happened with Colonial Pipeline doesn't happen to them. And those guys made a mistake. Clearly, they left a wallet funded for a long time. They won't, you know, they're not going to make that mistake again. So. Yeah, so uh, Bitcoin transactions are supposed to be here where we talk about the wallet being funded for a while. Um, and if you have some insight on how they recovered those funds or some of them. That was like that was the most interesting part of that whole debacle to me. Yeah. And could you give any insights you might have on how that happened? And is it happening in other cases of the markets? It's the only one I'm aware of, and what the FBI has hinted at is that they have previously gotten their hands on probably a phone. They, they probably you know, got their hands on someone involved with uh, dark side. And as a result, they had, basically they had the wall. They had the key. And my guess is, if I had been them, I would have sat on it for a little while to see what was going on until, and it, they just locked out that they had that one for that attempt. I mean, that was just, so that's the only thing. Otherwise, you know, the only other thing you can think of is they've got a quantum computer running somewhere like this. <laughs> so I should be spreading the rest of it. Yes, sir. Uh, in your experience, uh, how often do you see repeat victims? I, I'm sorry to give you this answer because I hate it, but all the time. Yeah, I have one client four times. But let me tell you why. Because, you know, it's, again, sort of going back to the panel I had today where it just it didn't sound like it's really easy in some ways, not so easy in others, but, yep. There are a lot of companies out there that are sitting on very old, you know, legacy enterprise systems that they cannot, you know, when people talk about patching, never mind like a seven or 30 day patching cycle. They're talking about, you know, the server, Windows Server 2003, right, which as a critical business system, 
and they haven't paid anything for 10 years to keep that thing doing anything other than what it was doing. So, yes, I know that they should have done, but the reality is they're running on slim margins. I mean, with everything going on, they just don't have the money to do all that. So, when, when they get hit, we try to do everything we can to close whatever that vector was that this threat actor used. But there's another one next to it or behind it. And the other thing we know is the access brokers will take any intelligence that they developed during that attack and feed it back out to someone else. So if they were in there and they noticed, well, you know, we didn't have to use the vulnerability at VPN appliance because we've got it through this RDP or we just fish them. But it's there. So just let it bring everything back out. And they pay, so. So, so the, the next question is why do they repeat those numbers pay? Like if they stop paying on the first or the second attempt, probably they're not going to be back again. It's, it's always a business decision. And the question is, do you pay or do you stop doing whatever it was you were doing? If you can't bring the system back. So for, for, the, for the business, it's, it's cheaper to pay a million dollar ransom and then keep hoping that they won't get hit again. But they keep enabling this, right? Yeah. Pay and pay and pay. Yeah. Until one of two things happens, um, if they were getting insurance coverage and relying on it, obviously that's right. Or, um, they listen, sometimes we can have a discussion with them where we say, look, this first, the second attack, they weren't that bad. There's a third iteration of an attack that's much worse, right? And that attack, you can't recover, even if you pay the ransom. So, anyway. Yes, sir? Just a comment, you're interested in ledgers, there's an O'Reilly book No, no, that's good. I mean, you know, one of the things they talked about earlier, and, I, and I, I'm a fairly big proponent of offensive measures, you know, what some people call hack back, but, but really depriving the, the enemy here of a battlefield that they can design for themselves, right? So in that, in that context, I think a, giving some people the right to go after the, uh, the, the hackers in their home turf if need be, taking the money or taking down their infrastructure. And they have to maintain infrastructure, right? So they have, one of the funny parts of this is, uh, I think it was Darkside at one point announced, we're gonna set up our bulletproof infrastructure in Iran. <laughs> Big mistake, they should have consulted their US lawyers. That's a joke, obviously. Uh, because by doing anything in Iran, they would be off limits. No one in the U.S. anyway could have paid many ransoms. So they immediately had a uh, press release. Sorry, didn't really mean that. We're not going to have our whole proposal in Iran. We'll do it in any number of places, right? But um, it's it's a business, and it has an infrastructure, and it has, and, and they're sophisticated. They've got operations. They've got people doing all the things that a business has. So they can be interdicted if you think about them as a business. And that's what I would do. Hunting them down and bring them to the U.S. to stand for the trial, that's, that's a really very, very small disincentive. You should still do it, but... Anyway. Well, you mentioned before that even with the key, that recovery is totally difficult. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so the decryptors are not what I would call the most elegant software, so this is software that the threat actor has developed that allows you to decrypt the encrypted data. So first of all, in the old days they were lousy, they didn't work with the threat. They've gotten better, they've clearly done their homework, and now they, they have, I'll tell you, fairly good um, support services. Um, I, I can call T-Mobile and be on the phone waiting for, you know, 
20 minutes to get a live person, and you call them, it goes directly to them. So they have they have good IT support. But the problem is it's still not it's still not great software, so it will fail. And then the other thing is, depending on what systems were encrypted, the decryptor may work better or worse. And so the databases, for example, the big databases, just by the nature of how they run, are very hard to decrypt successfully. Uh, there are other systems like that as well. And sometimes, um, you know, if there, there are just faults that happen with an encryption process that's not organic to the, to the OS, that you don't know. So that, it's, it's a very complicated process. So the first thing is you have to know what you've got, right? So, and now there are lots of tools, there are you know, good tools that will map your network and give you an idea, okay, you have this kind of stuff on this, on this system, this kind of stuff there. But then getting into it, that's where you really need to go to whoever's the business unit, whoever's running that and figure out what are you doing there? Um, one of my main questions is, do you still need that? Right? Companies are data orders like you wouldn't believe. So a lot of times, just doing that and saying, all of this, you know, garbage or cold storage or whatever you need to do to get it off, especially when it's personal information, IP, health information. If you don't need to have it available, take it off the network. You know, it's not a question of air gapping, you just bring it down, store it, put it under lock and key, you can't steal what's not in the safe. Right? You can get in there, but there's nothing there. So that's important. So data governance is a big is a big issue. And for a lot of companies, the other thing is they never really, like I said, even though we all think companies now are data companies, they don't really think that way organically, unless it's a, a global or something like that. So that's that's a big problem. So you need to have you certainly need to have the business people involved, operations, lead. Because the value of the data is my value. If I lose uh, all the patient files going back 10 years, and these patients are no longer my patients, I still have their data. Each one of those records to mitigate the compromise is a lot of money. You've got to report it to the federal government, to the states. You've got to go out and disclose it to individuals. You've got to pay for their identity back. All that stuff. For information that is no longer of real business value to you, that really just sucks. That happens a lot. Some people say that cryptocurrency ransomware insurance or ransomware insurance uh, just simply won't pay in Monero. Do you think it's likely that that will have a meaningful impact, or do you think it's more likely people will simply not buy ransomware insurance? I think I haven't seen very many of those. Have you? Where, what's that? Yeah. Okay. So there's you know one. Yeah. My guess is when that happens, people will have to raise it a different. Way. I mean, if your if your if your company is dying on you know the ransomware line, you're going to go and figure out another way to raise it. It's just you won't have that option. I do think that cyber insurance is going to cover a lot less ransomware very quickly. I think that model is going to change very quickly. So people who have ransomware coverage right now, I'd take the, the time, the year before your policy rolls over to get your shit squared away at home as quickly as possible. Oh. 
absolutely no basis on which to apply for that. I'm a lawyer, pays ransoms. So. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sure. Maybe that's the next panel. So, whatever.